most of the scholars have analyzed new forms and typologies of money laundering in digital environments only from a theoretical point of view. There is actually a, a scarce uh, empirical evidence. Mm, I've just uh, provided you a couple of studies that actually investigate empirically uh, the money laundering strategies of, of cyber criminals because at the moment most of the information and most of the available evidence is on how cyber criminals can launder uh, illicit proceeds using specific new technologies so how new technologies can be misused they can be abused of course for laundering illicit proceeds so as a result there is still the need for exploring how cyber criminals can launder and spend their criminal earnings um, J trying to jump in on the on the data and the methodology. Um, this, uh, here you have information, of course, also on the on the research question is quite broad. I wanted to investigate how do cyber criminal loaner the illicit proceeds. But when I was trying to come up, I would say with the best way of doing that, um, uh, it was actually not not easy. Um, during my most of my work, of course, I faced you know, many in a way criticism when working uh, with money laundering um, cases and of course police files and police information uh, regarding money laundering, because as you know, uh, and of course, most of the criminologists and other social scientists that work with police uh, files and police information, uh, of course, we, we know that in a way we are mirroring, of course, uh, the main constraints and drivers of police when investigating money laundering, as well, of course, of focusing on the so-called failed uh, money launderers. So the ones who are actually caught in the first place, they probably were not the best are doing their, their job. So I tried to, in a way, use a different approach to take all these research questions. And I focused on a specific case study, that's uh, the Conti uh, ransomer group. Uh, actually, I, choose this, uh, I chose this case study for two main reasons. The first one, of course, is as, as we all know, ransomware has become one of the main uh, cyber threats over the last years worldwide, but in the specific also uh, in the uh, European Union. Uh, and the second one is that con uh, the Conti ransomware group actually suffered a major data leak at the beginning of February 2022 uh, after their endorsement of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. They were leaked. Um, from an allegedly actually Ukrainian researcher uh, that took more than 160,000 of their internal messages and communication from two servers uh, of actually two main uh, communication channels that they used to communicate between each other. And of course, the researcher actually took these messages and leaked them out to the public. So I accessed these this database that of course is uh, available, is uh, now completely public and it's available online. And what I was interested in, too, uh, it was actually retrieving all the Bitcoin addresses that were mentioned in the internal messages, so in this data leak. Uh, why? Uh, why? Because actually Conti works in a, I would say, fun way. Um, each member of the Conti group was paid twice per month. Um, so each, of course, each member had its own tasks, its own uh, role in the organization. They, uh, twice per month, of course, they wrote to the boss, to the leader of the organization, uh, outlining what they have done in those two weeks, basically, uh, asking for payment on a specific Bitcoin address. So I wanted to look in the specific case to the last mile of money laundering, I would say, so when these offenders received their wages and when um, and how basically they did launder the illicit proceeds. So out of these 160,000 internal messages, I was able to retrieve specifically 182 Bitcoin addresses that were specifically identified by the same county members as those addresses that uh, in which basically they wanted to receive their wages. And using a specific, um, uh, actually a specific tool in this case, it was um, a blockchain analysis, analysis tool that's been developed by Scorechain. Scorechain is um, a blockchain forensic company. It's um, a company based in Luxembourg. Of course, as many other companies provide this type of tools for law enforcement agencies, private companies, and other entities to monitor uh, illicit financial flows um, in cryptocurrencies. So I used uh, this uh, this basic tool to retrieve 
a wide array of information, I would say, related to these Bitcoin addresses, from the type of the address to the balance to the timestamp. So when did this transaction occur, the amounts, of course, and then, of course, the destination. So where did they, these offenders move uh, their money? Of course, I also enriched this um, information stemming from these analysis with also some more qualitative evidence related to the, the messages and what uh, these offenders ex uh, discussed um, between each other in terms of money laundering. So jumping into the results, um, the first actual element that struck me uh, is, of course, the amount of the wage. Uh, so looking at the median wage payment, we are looking at basically a little more than $800 every two weeks. So it's a pretty low, uh, let's say, uh, amount if we're talking about, of course, illicit activities. Uh, but this is, of course, something that I'm currently investigating in another research project together with some other colleagues. 91% uh, of the addresses actually belong to non-custodial wallets. So, of course, as you as you may know, uh, we have a difference between non-custodial and custodial wallets. The non-custodial ones is where the private and the public um, keys are actually only in the possession of the, in this case, offenders, but all in the possession, of course, of the end user, are not stored and used by a third party entity, as it can happen, of course, in, um, in cases when you open up, for example, an account at an exchange or another, uh, of course, provider of services, that the so-called now VASPs. Um, the 82% of the addresses only had two transactions, so these offenders basically received the money and moved them out. And it's interesting to note that also the 98%, so I would say the, the, the totality basically, uh, started laundering the illicit proceeds in one single transaction. So they did not start to, let's say, smurf these a transaction, this amount, sorry, of, uh, of illicit proceeds into smaller, smaller amounts, but they basically took the bulk of it and start moving them. And actually, they, they started to do it quite quickly. So uh, the mean holding period was basically a little more than three days. So in three days, they received their wages and they started the laundering the, the proceeds. So just to give you an idea of what are the main destination, this is a simple bar plot, basically, showing you the main uh, destination we saw. Of course, these are not categories that are not mutually exclusive, so they do not sum to 100%, but each of these, um, in this case, addresses, of course, transacted with more than one on one of these entities. But we can see that the vast majority, so more than 71%, actually transacted with exchange. Um, this is can be quite be, let's say, uh, foreseen and expected in the sense that, of course, offenders want to spend the illicit proceeds and of course exchange allow them uh, to turn uh, cryptocurrencies into fiat currencies so like of course they, they give them a wider range of spending options and spending opportunities compared to of course cryptocurrencies that at the moment are quite restricted in terms of for example goods or services that you can purchase with um, these exchange of course are followed by dark web services 30 percent then we have payment services gambling websites and mixing services. Uh, that's how the, the last category. What's what's here interesting to note is basically, again, um, most of these offenders, and we are talking about the 70% of them, transacted directly with an entity, at least once in this case. And this is quite surprising if you think about it, because we are talking about, we are looking at money laundering transactions, but these offenders transact directly, so they do not have any type of, let's say, obfuscation layers between the source of the illicit proceeds and the, the destination, so where they move their money. They took the wages and they moved them, for example, to an exchange, so not putting any layers in between, but just moving them uh, directly. The 80% uh, and more of the illicit proceeds has also been sent to one singular service in the 70% more or less of the transaction. This is another quite interesting and surprising result, I would say, because again, not only they transact directly with an entity, a third party entity, but they also try to move um, all the proceeds within one singular service. So they do not try to, again, um, um, divide and move like the illicit proceeds in different uh, services. This, of course, again, can be quite a risky behavior. Um, the interesting element also to another interesting element again to to highlight is that there is a difference, of course, also in terms of uh, the amount 
of illicit proceeds. So we see that uh, illicit transactions um, totaling more than $1,000 can be quite more complex, I would say, compared to the lower ones. So in this case, transactions with more than $1,000 tend to rely more on mixers. You can see here the difference 26% versus 2%. So dark web services again 38% versus 27 and payment services. So 21% versus 11%. So we can see that of course there is a difference also in terms of the uh, overall amount of illicit proceeds that are moved uh, with offenders that want to move more illicit proceeds trying to go of course um, with let's say more complex uh, schemes and more complex operations. This is just uh, to give you also a glimpse on uh, some of the actual content of the messages when it comes to, to money laundering uh, in, the, in the data leak. Uh, I've just um, reported two main discussions that I, that I found also in the, uh, in, in the data leak, of course, also in the papers. There are a couple of more references, but these are, I think, were, are two, uh, quite interesting examples. So in the first one, we see actually um, the discussion and uh, uh, the exchange, I would say, of opinion also between one new member of the group that's just been recruited uh, and the HR, let's say. So the one, the other member was in charge of recruiting him. Uh, as you can see, the HR actually told him, well, like, the wages are, of course, in Bitcoin. Uh, and he also said, like, well, I recommend using a mixer. As you can see, the new hire basically uh, said that there is an understanding with cryptocurrencies, but what is a mixer? So uh, this is quite, again, quite striking because we, we often assume that these offenders are quite complex, quite sophisticated, I would say, that they have a clear understanding uh, of also the instruments that they can use to launder the illicit proceeds, especially in a very specific niche, I would say, like and be like ransomware. Of course, they need to deal with cryptocurrencies at all time because the, the, the ransoms basically are paid by companies and uh, governmental bodies, of course, in cryptocurrency. So they ask, offenders ask a ransom in cryptocurrency. But as you can see, um, some offenders in these, um, most, in most cases, I would say, um, they do not know any um, specific element or uh, like tool that are at their disposal and they can use for laundering illicit proceeds. And the second discussion is basically again um, from a member to the boss of the organization uh, these members send this message and saying well look the exchange reviews uh, refuse sorry accepting the funds they say that they come from unsafe sources what should i should do in such cases i send it to the mixer i'm waiting maybe it will help again the message is quite straightforward and again it highlights a lack of understanding of specifically the, the functioning i would say of cryptocurrencies and again the functioning of like money laundering uh, using cryptocurrencies because we can see here a member that took his wages and again transacted directly we sent it directly to an exchange of course the exchange that remember as most of you know of course they are now obliged entities and under, and anti under anti-money laundering uh, um, legislation of course they need to check what's the source of the funds. They need to file suspicious transaction reports to financial intelligence units if needed. And if it's, um, if it's actually the, the limit right to do so. Uh, in this case, this, this offender basically uh, sent the money. He got this message from the, the exchange. And what he did, it moved in later to a mixer rather than do it, it, doing it sorry, before sending the money to, to the exchange. So again, there is not a uh, very well clear understanding of uh, how the process should work. So just to, to wrap up and, and to conclude, uh, the, the main result is that offenders actually use good operational security practices, again, I would say, when collecting the illicit wages. So for example, um, they just receive the wages and move it out. So there is only a one incoming transaction and one outgoing transaction it is actually a quite good in terms of operational security when it comes to Bitcoin, because if you have a Bitcoin address, you do you do not want to reuse it multiple times. You only want to use it once. So again, receiving and moving, because otherwise you expose yourself to being, again, clustered. So to being like um, allowing others, in this case, like blockchain forensic companies to trace you um, over like the different addresses that you may um, possess but they tend to be surprisingly unsophisticated when it comes to money laundering. And this is quite 
quite surprising again. What are the potential drivers? Uh, the potential drivers, of course, again, is the small amounts of illicit proceeds. In this case of, of my sample, I only looked at uh, 56 offenders uh, of the of the ransomware, the county ransomware group. But again, the, the wage, the median wage was little more than $800. So again, if you want to launder $800 every two weeks, maybe you do not need to be sophisticated or you do not need to be sophisticated too much and engage in very complex schemes. Uh, the second element is that probably we are looking at offenders who are not skilled at all. And this is actually mirror, um, I would say, a quite a uh, large number of studies in the cybercrime domain that have found that, of course, out of uh, like a wide array of um, cybercrime offenders, only few have very specific technical expertise. And the same can happen in terms of money laundering. So we are looking actually at, the, at offenders who are not uh, very savvy, let's say, from a money laundering point of view. And the third one is the wider regulatory environment. Again, is high sophistication in this case truly necessary? Uh, FATF actually um, issued and, and published a report uh, um, at the end of 2023, uh, where they basically assessed and highlighted that 75% of jurisdictions basically are still not compliant or only partially compliant to standard on virtual assets. So if I can, for example, launder my illicit proceeds in cryptocurrencies, maybe sending this money to an exchange, which is not compliant because maybe it's located in a high risk jurisdiction, or for example, as it happened in some of the cases, it's based, uh, for example, in Russia or in some other Eastern European countries. Maybe I do not need, again, to be so complex. Maybe I can find some ways of laundering my illicit proceeds quite um, right away. So the key takeaway from my study, I would say, is that even allegedly successful offenders use basic money laundering strategies. So we know that, for example, there is a debate going on in the money laundering literature in terms of the complexity. So we know that most of like the policymakers, but even the media say that money laundering can be quite complex, while scholars um, have actually found consistently over time that money laundering is quite simple can be carried out quite simply. Uh, I think that this study adds to this literature saying that, again, even allegedly successful offenders, because most of the county offenders, one, especially those in the in my sample, have not been caught. So they say that are still at large. Um, we can say that they are quite successful in this case in their job, but even them do not engage in complex uh, activities, in complex money laundering schemes. So I think that this is something is telling us some things. Uh, and also, I just want to leave you with this, this question. So are we victims of the, the so-called ingenuity fallacy? So are we assuming, of course, that offenders, in this case money laundering, um, are more high skilled than they actually are? Um, so that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you indeed, Mirko. Uh, I immediately leave the floor to the two discussants. So Edwin, Chris Bergen and Pablo Zlatsky. Uh, uh, please uh, introduce yourself a bit before uh, going to the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Riccardi, Miguel. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation, uh, uh, Mirko. Uh, I will just say a few words about myself. I'm Edwin Kruisbergen. Uh, I work for the Dutch Ministry of uh, Justice and Security. I used to work at the Research and Documentation Center. It's a more or less independent part of the ministry where I um, conducted research for 17 or 18 years on organized crime, policing organized crime, uh, money laundering. I was the, the, the coordinator, the pro project leader of the Dutch Organized Crime Monitor for quite some years. Uh, since two years, I transferred to another position within the ministry. I'm not, uh, I do not work at the Research Documentation Center anymore. I'm now a, science, a, science, a researcher slash research coordinator within the ministry uh, itself. Uh, would you like me to to start with uh, some questions on my part or Miguel? Yeah, please go on. Yeah, okay, as I, I have not prepared for, for a very uh, long uh, uh, <laughs> uh, talk about the paper itself. I have some remarks and some uh, some questions, but I would like to start with uh, uh, with uh, well with a compliment because I think it's a really interesting and a valuable paper, and also a, a great 
contribution, an important contribution to the money laundering research. As you stated yourself in your presentation, but also in the paper, uh, instead of theorizing about the possibilities that, uh, that cryptocurrencies and related technologies offer money laundering, uh, offer for money laundering, you actually looked at how money laundering takes place in practice. Eh? You, you analyzed actual money laundering transactions of, uh, in this case, members of the, uh, the Conti ransomware group. Now, I think that's indeed a really great strength compared to other studies, not only the theoretical uh, contributions in this field, but also other empirical studies like I did myself. Uh, I, I mostly or almost exclusively, exclusively did research uh, by using police files. And I think this is a really a great contribution. Now in your paper, uh, you look you looked into the limitation of, of your study and, and the data you used in quite some detail. I still have a question about that. You you say um, that, like I just mentioned myself, eh, the, the strength of your study is that you used, you did not rely on police data, but you looked at actual money laundering uh, transactions, which were related to allegedly successful offenders, as you wrote it. Uh, why did you use that phrase? Did you, did you use that phrase because you, they were not uh, arrested yet by the police, or that's just a short question on my part. But uh, yeah, jumping quickly. Um, answer yes, basically. Oh. So, um, so okay. I use this uh, this phrase because they have not been caught yet. So actually, yeah. can, we yeah. can miss. Yeah. Well, of, of course, well, because one could argue if you look at the small amounts of, of the wages, uh, eight hundred or nine hundred dollars, uh, one could argue about the, about the question. If they really are successful, if they only earn that much, and if we perhaps are still looking at the transactions of rather lower level uh, offenders, which could explain their uh, rather quite simple money laundering methods. But this is a point you already made yourself. But I was wondering because you you uh, you used only uh, the Bitcoin addresses of uh, which were used for collecting wages, and you did not used the Bitcoin addresses, which were used for uh, internal expenses. And I was wondering if you looked at the latter one, so the Bitcoin addresses, which were used for uh, uh, internal expenses of the criminal group, would that lead to different results? Or th that's, what, that, that's one question. And another question, and then I, I will give floor to you again. Uh, Relates to the policy implications, you write that it's, it's really important that uh, that international bodies and national governments prioritize the proper Im implementation and enforcement of existing regulations in the next future to prevent the abuse of loopholes in cryptocurrencies. In my in my experience and opinion, I think one of the great uh, weaknesses for cybercrime offenders and one of the great possibilities for law enforcement relates to the fact that in the regular e economy, in, in the offline world, bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies are hardly uh, accepted anywhere. And then, then you can't buy a, a car, you can't buy a house. In fact, you, you, you almost can, can't buy a beer, a simple beer with using bitcoin. So because of that, Cyber criminals are forced to uh, to exchange their their bitcoins or other cryptocurrencies for regular currencies, and that that is a really a, a bottleneck for them because if they have to go exchange their their cryptocurrencies, that makes them vulnerable. Of course, one could argue, and that's a question I would like to uh, ask you, that if if uh, we go on and on with with regulating the the cryptocurrencies. Uh, that that might lead to a point that cryptocurrencies would be considered as safe by a large public and by by companies perhaps and it might also lead to a bigger acceptance of bitcoins which in turn might would make it much more easier to launder the profits to to launder uh, uh, bitcoins that are earned with, with cybercoin so do you agree with that line of reasoning uh, that 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 might be uh, an unintended negative side effect of uh, regulating cryptocurrencies. That are that are my main two 
questions or remarks I have for you. So it's just Mirko, if you want to answer now, maybe in three, four minutes, and then we leave to Pablo for his part as well. Yes, no, thank you. Thank you, Edwin, for the, the questions and the comments. Uh, I think they are quite pertinent and relevant. Uh, so starting from your the first comment that you made, um, yeah, again, I, I define in this case successful offenders in terms of the fact that, of course, they have not been caught, not in terms of the amount of money that they were making. It is also because, of course, as, as you may know, uh, the cybercrime landscape has been reshaped, I would say, and has been defined also by several scholars now uh, in terms of undergone like a sort of industrialization. So we know that uh, nowadays there are few, few uh, like cyber crimes, uh, cyber criminals, sorry, that are actually skilled, while there are many of them who actually make like quite uh, routine like tasks uh, and they are paid very, um, very low, uh, low wages. The Conti ransomware group is an example. Um, again, some of them, and, and if you look at the, at the data, we see that the income distribution is highly skewed. So there are few of them that earn the vast majority of the income, while there are many, many of them who actually earn very, very little. Uh, and this is actually something to, to take into consideration, and it belongs to the wider, let's say, um, cybercrime industry. So that's why I took another decision in terms of how framing these offenders uh, if they are actually if they're actually su successful or not. Um, when it comes um, in terms of like uh, trying to jump in also in terms of like the policy implications, I I, I understand your point and I uh, I agree in a way. But at the same time, I think that we cannot avoid like regulating this environment and this um, um, and of course these assets only to avoid that probably they become more exploitable and more open and available to the wider uh, community. Uh, there's, there are at the moment already available. Uh, there is, of course, like I, was, I would say, a mismatch in terms of the, the knowledge that you need uh, in a way to purchase maybe these, uh, these assets when it comes to the, let's say, the normal, uh, the standard citizen, the standard consumer that wants to uh, like purchase these assets, but it's already fairly available. Again, uh, BASPs have been regulated already. Uh, the issue um, like assets on a fairly regular basis, it's become more and more interesting uh, for of consumers to access, to purchase these assets for whatever reasons. They believe that they are like investments. Uh, so I would say that at the moment we need uh, to regulate uh, these assets to potentially avoid uh, gaps and opportunities for, for offenders. There will be always uh, the chance to, to launder illicit proceeds using these, uh, these assets. Um, but yeah, no, I agree. I agree and I understand your point and thank you for, for, for pointing it out. Um, yeah, Michele. Yeah, no, okay. Yeah, no, we will have uh, maybe yes. some more minutes at the end to, to discuss. Pablo, uh, the, floor is, the floor is yours also. Please introduce yourself a bit. Thank you so much. Uh, so I'm Pablo Slutsky. I am an assistant professor of finance at the University of Maryland. And most of my research is at the intersection of crime and finance on things such as money laundering uh, and banks or organized crime and firms. Um, so it is a pleasure to discuss this beautiful paper by Mirko. And let me start with a disclaimer. Uh, so I work in the finance department where usually we discuss unpublished papers. Uh, and the goal is to first summarize the paper for an audience that is not expert in the area, and then to make comments and criticisms to help the author make the paper better for the next version. Uh, lately, it seems that the goal is more to make the author cry and quit the profession. Uh, but the idea originally was to kind of help the author improve the paper. So what I'm going to do today is to give a summary of the paper from the point of view or to an audience that is not expert in this, and then make a few comments and provide some ideas for potential follow-up papers that hopefully will lead Mirko to a full prof uh, professorship. Okay, so how does Bitcoin and blockchain work? So this is a kind of 
basic idea of how these things work. Suppose that Mirko wants to send me some money. And then what we do is we create this virtual block containing all of the information. So this block will contain information on the sender, the recipient, the time, the amount, and those things. So then what we do with this block is we send it to everyone in the Bitcoin network. So all the computers, all the parties in the Bitcoin network will get this block, this potential transaction. Once all of these parties validate these transactions and authorize it, they will take this block, think of it as a piece of a puzzle, and put it in the public information domain. Okay, so they will take this new transaction, once that is, is validated, and then send it to the public domain and add it to the list of transactions. Once that happens, then the transaction takes place. Mirko sends me money. Okay, so what's the good thing about this technology and Bitcoin is that these blocks with information on transactions are a public information. Yeah, so this is in contrast to the situation where suppose that I want to bribe Mark for publishing a paper in a journal and he's the editor. If I want to send him money to his bank account in the Virgin Islands, nobody can see that. Okay, so the good thing is that here we can see every single transaction and all the information. What is the ugly part? That nobody can see who Mark is, right? So the recipient will be shown as a bunch of characters, right? So this is anonymous. We don't know who the parties in these transactions are. What is the thing that Mirko does? So he's going to exploit this Conti leak where someone that wanted to retaliate for the war between Ukraine and Russia and the support of this group uh, to Russia posted all the internal chats somewhere. Okay, so there we can see messages such as, hey boss, I'm finished with X, Y, and Z. You owe me R rubles. Please send the Bitcoin to my address. Okay, so Mirko is going to take all of these addresses where workers of Conti uh, want their money to be deposited in, and then he's going to look at what these guys do with the money. Okay, so I think that this is a clever idea. This gives us a lot of information on what is going on. And this is the main idea behind the paper. So what is it that I like a lot about the paper? It's an extremely relevant topical issue. Ransomware is everywhere. Universities, government agencies, everyone is facing these attacks. Uh, in addition to this, the paper is both an academic paper and a Bitcoin for dummies guide. So I, I know if you don't know much about Bitcoin, you can read and learn about the paper. And then we get a lot of information on what these people do with the money they collect as wages. Okay, what is one potential issue, and Mirko addressed this, is that the type of transactions that he uses might impose a bias. Uh, so I will make some comments on that, and then I will provide an idea on things that he could uh, do to further expand this paper. So what are the transactions used? So Mirko is going to use the transactions where employees ask for the wages to their bosses. Okay, so there are 243 Bitcoin addresses identified in this leak, and he's going to look at the transactions where someone asks for the money to be deposited in a Bitcoin account. Okay, so these are wages. And as Mirko mentioned, these are pretty low wages. So the average is about $1.5,000, uh, with the median below a thousand dollars. Just to put this in context, what I'm trying to find here is whether these guys are laundering money or these are just workers trying to exchange this Bitcoin for money to pay for basic expenses, such as rent, groceries, and those things. So I went on Glassdoor and I tried to find out how much a software engineer makes in Moscow, right? To put this in context. And it seems that the software engineer makes between four and nine thousand dollars a month, right? So these guys are making three thousand dollars a month. So these guys seem to be on the lower end of uh, this profession, and on the lower end of the Conti 
uh, structure. Okay, so I think that it's not surprising that we don't see that these guys are sophisticated and that they are using sophisticated, uh, sophisticated methods to launder money. Um, if I stop here, I will be a bad uh, discussion. So here's the idea that I have for you uh, for the follow up paper. You're using information on the guys who asked for the wages to be deposited into Bitcoin, right? But the public information has more than that. So here you're using information on the recipient of the money, okay? B. But you also know who is paying this wage, right? So you have information on the account where these wages are paid from, right? So with this, you can reconstruct the network of wage payments and see who is the employer and what other payments these guys are making, right? So you can go back, a step back and see who the employer is and who else these guys are paying and how else these guys are laundering money, right? So you have the addresses of Conti, basically, or you can trace them back and you can see what these guys do, right? So you can go up one step and see what these guys are doing. Hopefully you remember that a few weeks ago, many of you were at the Bahamas. Uh, meanwhile, I was in the beautiful Washington DC under the snow, but there was a nice presentation there by Michael Condor who works at the US Secret Service. And he showed us a map of uh, the type of transactions that sophisticated money launderers do. And it was way more complicated, right? So with the information on the addresses that Conti uses to pay wages, Maybe you can do something like this and map the money launderers in a better way, the real money launderers, not the guys that are uh, making a low wage and trying to pay rent. Okay, so this could lead to another paper. The second idea that I have for a follow-up paper is to compare how different types of criminals launder money. Yeah, so there was a paper um, in the Review of Financial Studies a few years ago where they exploited several uh, police um, actions against money launderers, drug dealers, and they found these also these addresses. So they look at Bitcoin seizures by law enforcement agencies, and here you have information on um, drug lords, you have information on people that funded, for instance, Silk Road, and Peter, you live in the area, so I don't know if you saw, there are many signs uh, in DC about Frank Gross, William Ulbricht, who was the founder of uh, Silk Road and he's serving a life sentence. So here you have information and there are also other sources of data for other offenders or other criminals, right? So there's information on darknet marketplaces and the users, uh, users identified in these places as drug sellers and other things. So what you can do here is to look at the behavior of these other criminals and how they launder money. So what you could do is to look at whether ransomware groups, drug dealers launder money the same way. All right? So here you could have a comparison between different types of criminals and how they uh, launder money. Okay, so summary, I find the paper super interesting. Uh, if you haven't read it, it should be on your reading list. Uh, and then I think that there are two potential extensions for this paper. One is to step back and look at how this employer or Conti launders money, and then you can compare sophistication across different types of criminals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo, for these uh, inputs and ideas. Uh, Mirko, maybe uh, answer Pablo's points in four minutes again, and then we leave the floor for a question from the audience. Yeah, no, thank you, Pablo. Uh, it's definitely great suggestions and food for thought, I would say. I will later ask for your presentation so I can take some notes. Uh, I, I agree. Um, it's two relevant directions to take. Um, let's say that, of course, I know that my paper has several limitations in a way. I was like um, a first approach that I came up with at the, the beginning when I, I actually saw the data and uh, I thought of way of using them and the best way actually uh, to, to use them given 
like Maya or so constraints in terms of, of like computational power that you need to to analyze these uh, these data this information I had the opportunity to use a, a specific tool for doing that but definitely looking at the um, at the employer side so where this money come from and trying to reconstruct the broader like transactional network would be definitely interesting and it's something that um, I can do probably quite I would say fairly easily um, and also, yeah, the second the second point again, it's it's quite quite relevant and potentially to to compare across different also um, like different predicate offenses and different uh, like criminal activities. Um, yeah, let's say it's it was a first approach, and and now I'm looking at ways of like exploring and uh, expanding my work on these both in terms of data and also in the in terms of like research that I want to do on the topic so yeah no uh, I don't know if yeah maybe we can leave the floor to the Q&A session but again thanks Pablo is was super useful thank you Thank you, Mirko. So there is already some uh, question in the chat. Mark uh, Nance, would you like to do the question yourself or do you want me to read it? Sorry, I need to be quiet because it's late here, so. Yeah. OK, so I read it. So uh, Mark says uh, related to Pablo's mapping idea and because of the low wage seems to be a red flag. Can you also see other transaction into the launderer's account? So do they work exclusively for Conti uh, or are they freelancers while also working for other groups, which basically are related to Pablo's point? If freelancers, maybe this wage isn't as low as it seems because it's just one of the main of the other uh, launderer streams. Yeah, no, thank you, Mark. It's a great point. Uh, I actually do not have that that information or I do not have that information to actually claim that probably they are like not doing also freelance work for other employers. I know that from the leak they are working for the group, so they are like employed in the group. And again, as I mentioned in my presentation, most of these addresses have only two transactions. So one incoming and one outgoing. I do not, they do not again use the same addresses for receiving other money. So this is again, it's the correct way of doing that. So again, to reuse your Bitcoin address uh, multiple times. Uh, but still, I cannot exclude at all that they are also doing some other work for other employers. What I know from also the leak uh, is that these people complain about their low wages, and you can find this information in the data leak, but they complain all the time about how lowly they are paid, about the working condition, about that uh, they should be doing other stuff, uh, they, they should not be in front of the computer like uh, all the time, because these guys work on a really let's say corporate uh, schedule so they are really have working days from 9 a.m to 6 p.m uh, and stuff like that again for making like 100 1500 on average every two weeks i don't know uh, but yeah no on your point i do not have that information because again there are only two transactions in most in around 80 percent of the addresses Thank you. Uh, Julia, do you want to ask the question or are you in a karaoke session yourself too? No, no, no karaoke so early in California. Um, yeah, so I, well, I had two. One sort of follows what you just said. I, I guess I wondered if you had a sense of, um, you know, if this is the data leak, like, is there any information on what kind of sample you're dealing with it and how it relates to the larger sample out there like do you have a sense of this is the low level people who are maybe just in training and so that's why we're seeing the smaller transactions is it the case that they're just attracting like people who can't get the regular jobs and so that's why it's being paid they're being paid less like just a little bit more about what you think the data represents and i wondered that in terms of the chats also specifically um you know, I know you said you sampled some of them. I was wondering if you had thought about using like a large language model or something to get like a broader sense of what is being discussed and how that might align with certain certain types of needs or populations. 
Yeah, no, thank you, Julia. That's that's another great point. Um, so in, in, for this paper, of course, as, as you can see, I just filter out uh, the Bitcoin address. Again, it's, it's fairly easy because they have a common structure. Uh, so you can uh, find out uh, easily what are the Bitcoin addresses and then reviewing the chat messages uh, was not time, too much time consuming, I would say. Uh, exploiting like large language models or text mining uh, is something that I'm doing together with some other uh, colleagues at Transcrime. So basically we are working again on this data to try to come up with the, uh, the structure and the network of the group. Uh, and that in that case we used uh, text mining to extract information also about their uh, their tasks, uh, their the, what they were basically doing in the um, in the group. So to assign to each member its corresponding task um, and, and so on. So uh, it's something that we are exploring. Uh, it's something that can be done. And there are already, I think, it's at least one, but probably two papers out there that has been uh, they've done basically this this same approach. So using models to automatically. Uh, classify these chat messages in the specific case for Conti, but also for other ransomware groups, because there are other data leaks out there uh, for um, the ransomware gangs. So yeah, it's something that I'm doing and yeah. Thank you, Mirko. I see a hand raised by Peter and also a question from uh, Mike Levy in the chat. So. There you're mute. Maybe, okay, yeah, now, yeah. No. Um, so, Mirko, if I could ask some sort of discrete questions, uh, what language are these messages in? Oh, the messages are like in, uh, in Russian, so in, uh, but basically the, the data that I used have already been translated in English using uh, uh, Google Translation API services. Uh, so we were provided by a third party. The translation has been done by third party. Uh, and we had in, in the sample, uh, sorry, in the database that I used, I had for each message the original text in Russian. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to read it and also the, the corresponding text in English. And what time period does it cover? Uh, it's from mid-2020, if I remember correctly, from mid-2020 up to February 2022. Conti uh, nowadays is not oper longer operational, so it was disrupted actually um, yeah, a little so, bit after the data leak. So. so what should we make of only 182 Bitcoin addresses showing up in that time period? So this is sort of 18 months roughly. So there are 10 Bitcoin addresses per month showing up. I mean, it sounds like Bitcoin was a very unimportant part of the payment structure. Or am I misunderstanding what, how comprehensive you, your data are in terms of payments that they received? Um, no, I, I understand your point. Um... My data probably is not so comprehensive because, I mean, the 182 Bitcoin addresses, of course, are those that were, again, mentioned specifically to be related with wage payments. So it's a smaller group of the whole like Bitcoin addresses in the leak. But again, I do not have any information at all at how much the leak was comprehensive. We are looking at an external attack to these servers. So whatever like this researcher was able to take from the, uh, to take and publish. Of course, um, out of this, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that I didn't mention in my presentation, but out of all these messages, uh, there is a, a fairly a fair large share that was encrypted. So I did not have access to the to this, the chat. It was a problem like in, in, in infiltrating, exfiltrating, sorry, uh, these messages. Uh, so again, in those encrypted messages, there could be other Bitcoin addresses. Still, I understand that my sample is limited and of course has many biases in terms of coverage and mm, up across the entire period, but that's the best I could come up with uh, using my data. That, that, I'm not being in any way critical. I mean, I think this really interesting data set and uh, if it's now available in English, the number of potential researchers goes up a lot. And I think it 
I mean, what, one, so one final kind of factual question is, why are they using emails? Why aren't they using encrypted communications all along? I mean, uh, when, careless or casual? So they were not email, emails. Uh, these messages were in The messages Sorry, were? Yeah, the messages were were actually exchanged using two open source uh, chat messaging apps. In the specific cases, uh, Rocket Chat and Jabber. Uh, there are two, yeah, chat chat messages uh, applications uh, that again provide opportunity to uh, exchange messages in an encrypted way. So they were not emails, uh, but they were exposed to some vulnerabilities that were exploited for taking these messages. Uh, example of criminal competence again. Okay, yes. thanks. Thanks, Mike. Would you like to to ask a question as well? Okay. Um, uh, sorry, I missed the uh, talk. I was in another meeting. Um, the yeah, I mean, we know quite a lot about the general total of uh, uh, ransomware uh, costs now. Um, so you might. Uh, Put that in the framework of the total uh, cost and what what it's plausible for the Conti group to be uh, to have been engaged in. That would be sidestepping some of the point that Mark has made um, uh, in order to 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 use a different kind of data source for that purpose. Um, but you know, if you're if you're attacking different groups with ransomware. Um, then uh, then it would make sense to divide them up because if the police are coming after you or or the victims lawyers are coming after you or in a civil route um then you want to be able to stop the total amount being confiscated or seized um so the, so it would make sense i think from to me from that point of view Thank you indeed. Uh, are there further questions? If no, so just a, a final conclusion word. Uh, first of all, I think that this discussion is exactly the reason why we uh, thought about setting up uh, the money laundering research network, uh, because it's it really uh, it's really helpful for a lot of us. Uh, and also, uh, I'm thinking loud that uh, uh, the whole discussion today could be also uh, published because I think it, it's really an example of how these uh, things should work. Uh, the second, I think all the points were made were absolutely proper. And uh, because the final question is, is crime really paying? Because from also the statistics that Pablo shown, it seems that it's better to be a legitimate uh, software engineer in Russia than being involved in a ransomware group, right? So I think this is exactly the type of question we need to answer uh, as all working for policy uh, purposes and uh, and uh, all the input received today go in that direction. So I would like to thank all of you, uh, the Mirko for the great presentation, Edwin, Pablo for the great question and comments and all the rest of the audience and see you in March, uh, there will be another webinar on the 7th of March. Uh, more information to be disclosed soon.